Live from KSAT 12. The six o'clock news starts right now. Yeah, and we want to get big. We want to begin with breaking news from the north side. San Antonio police responding to a shooting along Loop 410 just west of Highway 281. The call coming in around 520 and not a lot of information available just yet about what has happened here. And that was a look from Sky 12. This is a look earlier at that scene, and this looks like it is the ramp coming onto the main lanes of 410 at that interchange. You can see it's certainly slowing down traffic. Uh, we did see police talking to a man, presumably the driver. We did not see anyone else in that anyone else in that SUV. EMS did make the scene. They took a driver away. We don't know how badly that person might have been hurt. We do have a request for more information from San Antonio police. We will continue to follow it. Michelle Barrientes Vela in court this morning, making her first appearance in person in well over a year. The hearing coming just days after new indictments were filed against the ex constable and her former captain. Dylan Collier on an eventful day, both inside and outside the courtroom. Moments before Michelle Barrientes Vela made her first in person appearance in front of Judge Velia Mesa, a supporter of the ex constable tripped a KSAT photographer. Well, that's my son. He tripped. One of several apparent attempts to keep us from documenting the hearing. The state of Texas versus Michelle Barrientes Vela. The abusive office trial of Barrientes Vela, which had been scheduled for early next month, delayed again. The state this week filed new indictments against her and co-defendant Mark Garcia, a former Precinct 2 captain who was accused of repeatedly using false statements in 2019 to get a judge to sign off on an arrest warrant. That warrant then used to take a fellow Precinct 2 deputy into custody on a felony charge tossed out by prosecutors within hours. An attorney for Barrientes Vela described the new indictments as a procedural move. The state took the allegations that were all in one indictment and all the perjury counts, which were all on one count, and they separated them into separate indictments. Barrientes Vela, who has now been out of office for more than a year and a half, did not comment on her way out of court this morning. With the substance of the allegations against Barrientes Vela remaining the same, today's hearing essentially pushed back the trial date about two months into August. Reporting outside the Bear County Justice Center, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. A man is behind bars after allegedly shooting another man in the back of the head and stealing a car from an elderly couple. San Antonio police say this all started following an argument between two men doing some foundation work at a home in the King William area. Our Tiffany Huerta is covering this story for us this evening. She joins us live where that suspect was eventually caught. So Tiffany, how did all of this start? Myra, it's unclear what the argument was about, but it did start in the King William area and it ended here in the 600 block of Recio Street in the south side. But check out this video from earlier today. SAPD received a call for a shooting around 11 a.m. in the 300 block of King William Street. Police say two men were doing foundation work at a home and for some unknown reason began to argue. Things quickly escalated. Chief McManus says one man pulled out a weapon and shot a man in the back of the head. The homeowner was unhurt. He actually came out and um, I believe he performed CPR on the victim. The alleged shooter ran away and carjacked a Mercedes from an elderly couple. Police say that couple was not hurt. The driver took off and traveled south and was eventually captured on Recio Street. That's where we're located right now. We know the victim, a man in his 50s, is in critical but stable condition. Reporting from the south side, Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. A little hard to hear you there, but thank you, Tiffany. Conflicting orders and confusion regarding COVID-19 protocols at the Bear County Courthouse. Governor Greg Abbott issuing an executive order effective today that says the county can no longer require or mandate wearing masks. But local administrative judge Ron Ron Hells says he will continue protocols in place at the courthouse that require visitors to wear masks and maintain social distancing. The Texas Supreme Court has told judges that anything coming out of the governor's office related to these types of requirements don't have an effect. Ron Hill said that until he gets updated guidance from the Texas Supreme Court, current protocols, wearing masks and social distancing remain in effect.
New at 6, the latest on the ecumenical push citywide by different faiths to get more people vaccinated. San Antonio nearing one million first doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, more than three quarters of a million now fully vaccinated. But Metro Health estimates there are still well over half a million more who are eligible, but they're unwilling or unable to get their shots. Jesse Degollado tells us what some faith leaders suggest should be done to help change that. Antioch Missionary Baptist Church is holding another pop-up clinic on Sunday for those needing their second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. The response last time, the pastor says, was decent, but not great. Only about 120 shots were given over eight hours. We certainly would have liked to have done a whole lot more. Um, and we have the capacity to do more. Still, he says, being that they're done on a day of worship is a blessing. What I found was... A lot of folks who came to church turned right around to get the vaccine, who would not have gotten the vaccine otherwise. The Archdiocese of San Antonio has been doing what it can to get parishioners vaccinated as well, like Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra last March. We had been promoting it, even at the local parishes, but we need to do more. Much more. The Archbishop says he wants to see more parishes on Metro Health's growing list of pop-up clinics. But on Sundays would be best, he says, so when people come to Mass, it's there for their convenience. People are ready to give it to you. Please, please, for your own sake and the sake of all, get vaccinated. Both church leaders also urge employers to give their workers the time they need to get their shots, especially those on minimum wage. An extra day, they say, also would be helpful to get over any side effects, since many can't afford to call in sick, so they're avoiding getting vaccinated. Please encourage them to do so, and please, please, please uh, consider giving them time off, a uh, paid time off, to get that vaccine. It is immoral responsibility. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. We have new information at six on the shooting where an armed via bus driver, excuse me, via bus passenger was shot and killed by police. The police report states that passenger identified as Terry Bishop banging a gun against the bus window before the shooting. The report goes on to say a police sergeant and officer arrived and at first tried to taser the passenger Bishop. When that didn't work, police say Bishop pointed the gun at them. That's when the sergeant fired several shots at Bishop, according to the report. Another officer arrived on scene shortly after and says he saw Bishop handcuffed, but the officers were using life-saving measures. EMS arrived and later pronounced Bishop dead at the scene. The new abortion law signed by Governor Greg Abbott this week not only bans abortions after a fetal heartbeat is heard in the womb, it also provides a legal remedy to those who object to an illegally performed abortion. This expansion of abortion limits into the courtroom is a new approach that appeals to right to life supporters, but worries those fighting for abortion rights. Ursula Perry explains both sides believe lives are at stake. Abortion is essential health care and without it, people will die. And it's going to save thousands of lives in Texas, so we're really excited. The signing of the new Texas abortion restrictions is a first-of-its-kind provision, offering private citizens the right to sue abortion providers and or those who help to get an abortion performed outside of the fetal heartbeat criteria. But that would leave all others, family members, abortion rights supporters, rape crisis counselors, and medical professionals. They all could be open to lawsuits, as well as be forced to pay at least $10,000 and attorney's fees if they lose. Clinics, nurses, doctors, friends and family of people um, who may have sought, to, sought an abortion, it opens them up to frivolous, harassing lawsuits. It also will add a new type of lawsuit into the already pandemic backlogged court system where those legal claims could be filed literally by anyone. The lawsuits that are brought are going to still have to meet those legal standards. And um, so some of them will certainly be upheld and go through and some will probably be dismissed. Right now, Texas allows abortion up to 20 weeks of pregnancy. The new fetal heartbeat law goes into effect on September 1st. Between now and then, it's expected there will be a slew of legal challenges being teed up all across the country, not only for this law in Texas, but those across the country that were recently passed, eventually some of them ending up in the Supreme Court. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. 
Let's take a look at a trouble spot out there on the roads this evening. I-35 at St. Mary's. You're looking north, so the tie up here is in the southbound lanes, and it seems to be a stalled vehicle that is causing this issue, uh, both as drivers continue there on I-35 and merge onto to other areas. So things definitely slow going, but it appears to be all because of a stalled vehicle. A new airline coming to the San Antonio International Airport. Today, airport officials announcing Breeze Airways is coming in just a few weeks. Breeze is a part of JetBlue Airways, but they focus on secondary cities that are largely overlooked by bigger airlines. Breeze Airways officials say 95% of their flights have nonstop flights with prices as low as $39. Some notable routes will be direct flights from San Antonio to Oklahoma City to Tulsa, Oklahoma and Fayetteville, Arkansas. Breeze Airways flights begin May 27th. Take a live look outside right now. 85 degrees. Beautiful start to the weekend. Absolutely. Yeah, and you may notice it feels muggier and more humid outside. We have this tropical air mass that's moving in place. We only made it to 86 for the high temperature today, not far from the average. But that tropical air mass is going to keep it muggy and add even to our rainfall potential as we get into the upcoming weekend. Let's talk temperatures first. We're 80s right now. 81 Bernie, 87 Stinson, Devine's 85, Bull now at 83 degrees. Around 90, closer to the Rio Grande. Del Rio's 93, Carrizo Springs 88, and Laredo 93 degrees. Uneventful this evening, partly cloudy, a few stray showers, especially closer to the Gulf Coastline. Basically between I-37 and I-10, better odds of that stray shower. Otherwise, just muggy and temperatures falling down into the 70s. But we're watching closely this swirl here in the Gulf of Mexico. It technically could get a title from the National Hurricane Center in the hours ahead. Nonetheless, the impact's gonna be the same for us this weekend. It's gonna look and feel tropical. I'm gonna explain that and talk about those rain chances in more detail coming up. All right, thanks, Adam. A local student is a finalist in a nationwide writing contest on the impact of violence and helping other kids. We'll introduce you to this student who's getting attention by doing the right thing next. New at six, a nationwide challenge called Do the Right Thing is giving middle school students across the country the chance to write about how violence has impacted them and what solutions they believe can better help their peers. Erica Hernandez spoke with the county judge spearheading the San Antonio essay contest and one of this year's finalists. The pattern of violence could end. If someone was there for them, if they knew the powerful words to use, maybe things could be different. Writing about her own experience, Driscoll Middle School 7th grader Riley Leal is one of this year's finalists for the Do the Right Thing Challenge. It wasn't easy for Riley to write the essay, but she hoped it would inspire others. I hope that they use their voice because our voice is like the most powerful weapon that we probably have. Use their voice to speak up for others and also speak up for themselves. 57th Civil District Judge Antonia Artiaga helped bring the contest to San Antonio about six years ago, and since then it has been a way to find solutions to stop violence in Bear County. We've been able to give uh, children and a path, an avenue to express any violence that uh, they want to talk about, anything that they feel like they have a solution for, because kids come up with some of the best things. A ceremony will be held next Tuesday for Bear County's six finalists, and to announce this year's top two ambassadors. And whether she's an ambassador or not, Riley is just excited she got this far. You know, I still have to compete with the other girls as well um, next week with my essay. Uh, even if I don't win, I am still so incredibly proud of myself because I never even thought that my essay would um, actually get into the finals. I just really like writing. The top two essays chosen will be published in a national book that includes all the winning essays across the country. For more on the Do the Right Thing Challenge or how your school can participate, just head to our website, ksat.com. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. And we wish Riley good luck. Absolutely. Sky 12 over the San Antonio Botanical Gardens. What a beautiful shot. Oh, and they have to be loving this rain that we've seen, Adam. Oh, absolutely. Everybody's loving the rain. Everything's green down there. Everything's green outside. The lawns are actually growing, too, and you don't have to water them. Yeah, that's the nice saving thing. on the sprinkler bill. Uh huh. Yes, and just not having to use that water from the aquifer is a good thing. So I want to talk about our primary weather headlines here. We've got that swirl in the Gulf of Mexico I mentioned earlier. It's going to look and feel tropical this weekend. 
kind of like a typical Florida day. You know, if you ever spend time on the beach, you go to Florida, that tropical, very muggy outside, some sunshine, then you get some darker clouds at times, and then some sporadic downpours pop up. That's basically going to be what our weekend's going to consist of. So rain and some sunshine as we get into the weekend. Let's talk about it. We have a lot to go over first. Here's what we're tracking. It's this swirl in the Gulf of Mexico. The National Hurricane Center has it at about a 60% chance of developing into maybe a tropical depression, maybe even a low end tropical storm for a brief period of time as, as it approaches the Texas coast tonight. What I want to really reiterate here is regardless of title, we can call it a swirl. You could call it a tropical depression if it gets to that point. Call it a disturbance. The impact is going to be the same. I don't care what its name is. The impact would be the same for us here in South Texas. So let's talk about this here. There's that well-defined center of circulation, basically a low pressure system that's moving through the Gulf of Mexico. And you add the rainfall on this and the, it's within radar range. Now you can see actually some showers out ahead of it. Some showers were on the west side of it as well. We had some convection there today. It's pulling in some dry air and it's going towards slightly cooler sea surface temperatures. So I'm doubtful that it's going to really develop that much more. Doesn't matter. The impact for us would be the same. That's a tropical weekend. See these downpours we have out there right now. Victoria moving toward Goliad, Cuero. We'll continue to see those coming and going, popping up through the weekend, especially closer to the Gulf coastline. That's where we're just probably going to see most of them. But even here in San Antonio and parts of the hill country will likely get clipped periodically this weekend. Let's take a look at what I think is the best computer model in this situation right now. We lose our daytime heating. We lose some of the kick from the atmospheres. So midnight tonight, just some leftover clouds out there feeling sticky outside stray shower possible. Once we get into tomorrow, the sun comes up. So 7 a.m. start to see a few showers and storms developing fairly isolated in nature. Once we get a little more daytime heating and help from the sun and that swirl coming closer to us, then we'll have probably some of those downpours popping up here and there. It's a kind of situation where you can still get outdoors and get some stuff done. Enjoy a bike ride here and there. Just just know you may have to wait out some showers or even some downpours. Notice by four o'clock, some of that activity starts to move northward. And then Saturday, we're going to have a similar situation with just some of that sporadic activity. If you're along the Rio Grande, I'm doubtful you'll see much in terms of rainfall over the next couple of days. So here's what we're thinking tomorrow around the noon hour is when we're spiking the precipitation chances up to 60% at that point. And you know, that's give or take a few hours, of course, but that seems to be the time frame when it's just more likely around San Antonio. Nothing severe expected. It's that kind of situation where it's tropical, so you get those downpours that are kind of fun to watch from the porch. You know, sit down in that rocking chair and watch the rain come down hard, and then you get a little sun on the back side of it. Maybe I'm the only one that enjoys that. I'm imagining you in a rocking chair. But it's fun. Imagine you in a rocking chair. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm more pacing around. Hey, yeah, it's humid outside. Gonna it's going to stay humid this weekend. We talked about those wow. rain chances. Well, you never know. I mean, I might be a rocking chair kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're all saying no, even Greg. So Saturday and Sunday, we're wording it as some sun mixed with those sporadic showers and where the downpour set up, uh, we could have some localized flooding just because we're saturated, which is nice that we're saturated and into next week. Still some uh, scattered activity likely to develop. Not too hot, though. We're looking at near 80 all weekend. See, my vision of you in a rocking chair is like the rocking chair going as fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Could go. I'm thinking more he he finds a problem with the rocking chair, goes into the garage and, and turns to out to be it. like a yeah. turbo <laughs> And comes up chair. with a better, faster <laughs> rocking chair. I feel yeah. like y'all are my neighbors. With a, ther like with a, on with a thermometer Absolutely. on it. With a thermometer on said improved a rocking A well-calibrated, yeah. accurate thermometer. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so I guess in a way you can say the Spurs just got off the NBA roller coaster. This well, year. yeah, and you can imagine being a rookie. This is your first season ever in the NBA, and you go through this COVID-compressed 72-game Marathon. When we come back, what a year it was to be a rookie, and we'll address that coming up. Also, he's ready to defend his title. We're talking about San Antonio's own world boxing champion, Mario Barrios, coming up. 
After losing to the Memphis Grizzlies in their first ever playing game, the Spurs offseason began for the first time after losing back-to-back -back opportunities to be in the playoffs. But the future looks bright with young players such as Lonnie Walker, the Ford, Devin Vassell, and Kelvin Johnson, along with DeJounte Murray, and fully recovered Derek White, who battled injuries and setbacks all of last season, missing the stretch run with an ankle injury. What did a rookie playing in a COVID-compressed season learn from his experience, especially down the stretch when the Spurs are forced to play 40 games in 68 days? It's like nothing I've ever been uh, through before, honestly. You know, playing every other day, playing sometimes five games in seven days, like, you know, it's tough. It's tough mentally, it's tough physically, but I just got to give credit to, you know, my the, the, the training staff, my vets, them just helping me push through. Um, there are times where just mentally, you know, you play three, three games, four games, and you're tired mentally, and, you know, you got to get ready to play another game, and, you know, but everybody's encouraging you. Everybody has faith in you. And, you know, that's huge, you know, especially as a rookie playing for the Spurs. When, when people are uplifting you, it's huge. After ending the Spurs season 196 on Wednesday, now the Memphis Grizzlies face another must win and play in playing game against the Golden State Warriors in San Francisco tonight in order to qualify for the playoffs at number eight. This after the Lakers came from behind to beat the Warriors 103 to 100 on Wednesday for the Grizzlies. Jaron Jackson, who missed 56 games this season, returning his meniscus in his left knee during the play in the bubble. What does it mean to the son of a Spurs champion to be at this point? This is what I play for. This is the whole reason I came back is to play in games like this. Um, I'm just thankful to be out there, really. Uh, it definitely was a long year, of, and before not being able to play in the, the last game of the, the previous year was definitely hard to watch, and I'm just glad to be out there helping the guys, and it's, it's just a lot of fun playing in these meaningful games, playing in games that matter. Um, it was great. Tip-off time tonight, San Francisco is set for 9 p.m. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Houston Texans have brought in Justin Britt to start as center, supposedly for quarterback Deshaun Watson and rebuild of the Texans' offensive line. Britt started 54 games as center for the Seattle Seahawks from 2016 to 2019 before a knee injury ended his season. Now, after missing all of the last season with a torn ACL, Britt has declared himself healed and ready to play. So what does he bring to the Texans after playing with Russell Wilson? A winning culture, not that they didn't have one, but I mean, you look at the record, it speaks for itself. And so, I mean, there's a reason they brought me here. I'm going to bring attitude, aggressiveness. Um, you know, I'm going to play smart at the same time, but, um, you know, I, I, I just want to play football and I know how, and I can make sure we're on the same page. Um, you know, I understand my job as center. I understand the job that the right tackle has and the left tackle. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm just ready to get going. San Antonio world champion Mario Barrios is getting ready to headline the Showtime pay-per-view event against Gervonta Davis in Atlanta on June the 26th. This will be for the WBA Super Lightweight Championship belt that Mario currently holds. This is a big fight. It's, a, it's exciting. You know, we got, I mean, me and Senga both undefeated fighters. Neither one of us wants to lose our O. But, you know, someone has to, and uh, I'm mean, I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes you know, to make sure that's not me. You know, I'm excited. Uh, I do all my talking in the ring, and, you know, come June 26, uh, I'm going to continue to show everybody, you know, how great I am. All right, and he's back at training already, so he's ready to go. All right, thank you, Greg. You got it. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. It is a way to use technology to connect us with our past, the history of San Antonio, and a lot of it unknown to so many of us. We're talking about the Seed of Texas project, and to discuss that, give you an idea of what it's all about, in today's KSAT Q&A, we are proud to be joined by Professor Jessica Nolan, UTSA, the Department of Philosophy and Classics, professor and archaeologist, you have a wealth of knowledge to share with us. So let's start by talking about what the Seed of Texas project is. It's an interactive website, but give us an, a glimpse of what all people can find. Yeah, so it's an interactive website that tries to tell the history of Bear County, going back all the way into the origin of human settlement within Bear County. And that goes back 12,000 years, even though we just celebrated the tricentennial, there's human occupation well before that here in Bear County. And so what we're trying to highlight uh, with this website is that diverse, broad history that we have here. Uh, we're trying to do that through a number of interactive, uh, what are called GIS maps that layer on historic documents, data and maps and allow us to visualize them uh, here in our own modern 
uh, setting. So we've used that um, kind of think of it as a, a Google Maps for history, basically. And it goes through a number of different phases. Uh, we're doing the entire history of Bear County from prehistory all the way to the present. So we've broken it up because that's a lot of material to get through. And so we've completed our first two phases that go up until uh, the beginning of the railroad here in 1877. And we'll be continuing on with phase three going until uh, the end of World War II in 1945. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the things that, that I think even we're using is, are some of the imaginations of what this site looked like way back when and current day where these sites are. I mean, that's that's what really the average San Antonian and Bear County resident can take from these, correct? Absolutely. One of the images that you just saw was a 3D reconstruction of what Bear, what San Antonio, San Antonio looked like in 1820, and that was all drawn uh, from historic documents, uh, paintings from relatively close to that time period, and some of the maps that we found that gave us a, an idea of what San Antonio looked like at that time period. And so we were able to layer those on to uh, modern maps to be able to show, you know, what you're driving by when you drive through downtown San Antonio, um, you know, why the city is laid out the way it is, because the acequias from those first Spanish settlers really structured the streets while also providing irrigation for the fields. Um, and so you might be walking by some of the, those things uh, right as you're walking around downtown or even further out in the rest of Bear County and not know necessarily what you're walking by. And so what we wanted to do with all of this is bring that history to life, make sure that people understood how deep that history here is in Bear County and how broad it is. It's not just about the Alamo. It's about so much more than just that one particular site. And on top of these maps, which I'm, they really are interactive. I mean, you can get on this website and manipulate them and change the yeah. views and, and see some really interesting things. But this project also includes uh, birth records, burial records. I mean, things that people can trace back in, in their family if, if they want to. Absolutely. The San Fernando burial records were recorded by priests from 1744 until 1860. And so they give us information like the name of the individual, uh, their cause of death, their Costas information that tells us a little bit about their ethnic background um, and when they died. And so you can use the website to both get a general sense of what's going on in the community in that time period. You know, what, what kind of diseases were they all dealing with at that time, which I know we're all very familiar with now. Um, and uh, you can actually look at one of the websites that we've linked to. You can actually, you know, search back in the records to see some of your ancestors. And that goes for the San Fernando burial records and for the maps that we digitized of the early Spanish allotments from the very foundation in 1718. I just heard about a descendant of a Canary Islander who was able to find uh, their original lot that their ancestor actually had when the city was first founded in 1718. And they're able to find that they own the land right in the downtown area and they know exactly where that is. So that's really special. All right, philosophy, classics, archaeology. Obviously, I, we joked before you were on the air that you wear a lot of hats, some of them hard. Um, <laughs> it, is there a couple things in this study that grabbed your attention that you found especially fascinating? Oh, there's a, a million different things that I find particularly fascinating and interesting. For from my background as a as a Roman archaeologist, um, the Asecchia system has a lot of kind of reminiscence of Roman aqueducts. They were also a way to bring water to different areas. And if you go visit um, Hot Wells Hotel and Resort, a lot of the structure of it looks very similar to Roman bathhouses that I've uh, been able to visit. So there's a lot of tie-ins between all of those things. But I would say that you know. Anybody who's interested in history or doesn't even know the history around them, there's going to be a million things that you can find and discover in these websites. Um, every single module has tons of information that isn't necessarily always accessible to the public, and so you might not necessarily know about it. And I would really encourage you to look through the modules and see all of the different types of history that we have. They cover, like I said, from prehistory until the present, and they cover a wide range of communities. We emphasize the indigenous community, uh, the Hano community here and the African-American history in, in the city as well. So there's something in there for everyone. There is so much more we could talk about in terms of this yeah. project, but we've got to wrap things up. Before we go, can you just give us the website for people to make sure they know how to access all this information? Absolutely. The website is very simple. It's heritage.bear.org. 
heritage.bear.org. And again, I want to give credit to who's behind this UTSA along with Bear County, correct? Exactly, UTSA and Bear County, and we work with a lot of local historians, so their work is involved and acknowledged as well. So much to learn from this. Professor Nolan, thanks so much for sharing your time. Thank you. We'll be right back. All right, it's a slim down event this year, but it is still happening. And, you know, there are so many things that are part of Fiesta that yes. I wonder, where did this begin? Has it always been like this? We, we know so many of these signatures, the yes. parades, the medals, and the royalty. This week's episode of KSAT Explains is all about explaining the why behind some of these traditions that we know are signatures for Fiesta. We're excited it's happening this year. Yes, not quite the same, like Steve mentioned, as it's been in years past, but it's happening, and that's a big step in this pandemic. So in honor of that, our episode this week is taking a look at how the parades came about how the medals came to be and something that was really interesting I found out the kings and queens that idea actually started in San Antonio before Fiesta that is not unique to this party with a purpose so we're explaining how all of these things really shape this citywide celebration we know today yeah from El Rey Feo to maybe your favorite festivity taking I am place so very upset with us that we did not work <laughs> that in to yeah. this week's episode. We also talk about uh, the why behind Fiesta. We've you've heard it called a party with a purpose. We explain that. What does Fiesta really benefit? How do organizations get involved? It's a party, of course, but there is a process that these nonprofits have to follow to make sure that all the money that we spend out at Fiesta, it is going back into our community. And even the three signature parades of Fiesta, they each mean something different, correct? Yes, yes, they absolutely do. And we talk about the evolution of those, how Fiesta all started with the Battle of Flowers right. parade. That is really the root of Fiesta. And then everything uh, blossomed around the, I thought you'd be proud of that. I like how thank you, you worked thank that you, in thank there. You. Yeah, that's Blossomed nice. around the Battle of Flowers parade. So go check out this week's episode. We're getting geared up for things to start with Fiesta June 17th. You can watch the episode now on demand. KSAT.com slash explains or on the KSAT TV app. Adam, did you hear that? She said Battle of Flowers parade and blossom. I think I'm rubbing off on her. I think, yes, she's <laughs> slowly picking it up uh, through osmosis or something. I don't know, but we got to love it. Got to appreciate it. Sunny out there right now. We're at 85 degrees at 641 p.m. And we had some patchy clouds develop. It's this tropical air mass that's moving into place and you're feeling it's muggy outside. It's 85. Wind out of the east at 11 miles per hour coming off the Gulf Coast, basically. By 10 o'clock, we'll be down in the mid to upper 70s, about 77 degrees, and then midnight, 74. Isolated rain chances this afternoon and evening. A few have popped up along the coastal plain. We'll take a look, close look at those and really talk about what we're expecting this weekend. Coming right up. If you're heading out tonight for dinner, show your server some extra love. It is National Wait Staff Day. It's been a tough year for people in the service industry all due to the pandemic. You should always treat your wait staff yes, you kindly, should. but especially today. A hardworking wait staff, very important to restaurants. In fact, 95% of those surveyed in a restaurant.com poll say a waiter or waitress can make or break their dining out experience. 71% say they're more likely to order a dish recommended by their server. I can see that. Were you ever, were you ever a waiter, Adam? I, uh, I, I didn't wait, but I did cook at the grill at Braemar oh. Golf Course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple of years there. Then I drove the picker on the uh, driving range. Is that the, uh, same, is that the that. same golf course where you learned how to tap a keg? Just or funny. allegedly learned how to tap a this keg. This is really funny, but yes, <laughs> I still hold the oh, record okay. for, yeah. S the speediest oh, keg swapping out in the back. The debate never dies, does it? <laughs> Why'd you have to bring this up? If there was just know, one time you know, at Oktoberfest you know. where Adam couldn't tap the keg, and so I'm just saying, you know. Two times. Yeah, he's two just times. quickly summing it up for our yeah, viewers to make sure they're aware. Yeah. Klaus, if you're watching, I know you're having a good <laughs> chuckle right now. <laughs> having a good chuckle, and everybody at Beethoven's. Yep. Yep. Uh, okay, let's talk weather for a change. Let's do that. How about we just move on into the weather? Swirl in the Gulf of Mexico. 
It's going to look and feel tropical this weekend. Feel humid. We'll have a little bit of sunshine peeking through the clouds, and then you'll have some gray clouds and a few downpours popping up here and there. And that's how basically this weekend's going to go. So let's talk about it. Here's that little area of disturbed weather that we're watching. It's this swirl, that circulation that's just east of Brownsville, it's about 150 miles southeast of Corpus Christi. And actually, since we last chatted, the Hurricane Center even dropped that probability of development from 60% down to 50%. But what I really want to reiterate, no matter, no matter the title of this system, say it becomes a tropical depression or a low end tropical storm with a name briefly, which is unlikely. But if that happens, the impacts are going to be the same for us. This is headed toward the Gulf coastline. It's going to bring some areas of rain, especially along the coastal bend. But even here in San Antonio and the hill country could get clipped by some of those downpours. It's tropical air mass that's moving in place, and that's what we're seeing. It's lost a lot of its thunderstorm activity around it, an indication that um, it's not strengthening at the moment. Still has some time overnight tonight, but here's what we're looking at now. It's throwing some showers onshore, especially Houston area and north of Houston now, even parts of Louisiana. But locally, we've got these downpours that have popped up. DeWitt County, Goliad came out of Victoria as well. And these are showing signs of weakening. They're still moving westward, so you got to keep an eye out here in Carnes County. You'll probably get clipped by the leftovers of this and even southern Gonzales County. Luckily, not enough right now to really cause any flash flooding. But as we get into the weekend, there is the potential of that because we're just so saturated, especially east of I-35 and closer to the Gulf Coast. Here's our future cast. The model in particular, I think, is most trustworthy with what's going to happen right now. And it's a fluid situation, of course. Check back in for updates, but this is what we're expecting at the time. By late tonight, early tomorrow morning, the little swirl comes on shore. Maybe an isolated shower or two. Tomorrow we start the day, a stray shower or two, more clouds than sunshine. And then once the sun comes up and starts to warm us up a little bit, that'll help generate some of those uh, pop-up showers and even a few thunderstorms, but mainly just looking at tropical downpours here and there. Best way to put this, you could still sneak outside and go outdoors, get some things done, but just be prepared to be interrupted by a downpour here and there. They just You can still get outside and do things, but periodically you may have to wait it out. And we're not expecting anything severe. Even through tomorrow evening, it's the kind of stuff that's fun to watch from the porch because it's mostly just heavy rain coming down for a brief period. And we do think the highest odds of that, at least in San Antonio, are around the noon hour, give or take a few, around the noon hour, that's when we bumped our pops up to 60%. So the probability of precipitation at that point up to 60%, and then we kind of drop it off around there. Sunday's going to be sporadic in nature, though. Humid out there, dew points back to near 70 degrees, and it's going to be sticky all weekend long. So we're wording it as some sun mixed in with the sporadic downpours, localized street flooding possible because of the the nature of those downpours in some spots, but overall we're not expecting anything severe. That's the nice thing, the tropical air mass. Near 80 all weekend and next week, some more scattered activity Monday and Tuesday. I like that. Pops, probability of precipitation. That's right. You're welcome. I'm just going to walk in the weather center. What's the pops for today? Yeah. What are the pops? What are the deweys? The deweys and the pops. Yeah. <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. <laughs> Here's today's I See Why Am I. Good morning. It is Friday, May 21st. Happy Friday. Thank you so much for starting your morning with us. And first and five, a lockdown has been lifted at a Northeast ISD middle school after a student found a gun on campus. NEISD tells us it happened at Ed White Middle School after school was already dismissed. Chief McManus says police received a call for the shooting around 11 a.m. in the 300 block of King William Street. Police say two men were doing foundation work at a home and for some unknown reason, and began to argue. Things quickly escalated. He pulled out a weapon, shot the guy in the back of the head, and ran down Madison where he carjacked a Mercedes from an elderly couple. The Bear County Sheriff's Office has arrested 34-year-old unit officer Frank Ramos. They say on May 17th, they received a complaint from an inmate saying he'd been assaulted. After confirming the assault with security footage, investigators later learned it was ordered by Ramos. He's charged with official oppression and assault bodily injury. 
Ramos has been with the sheriff's office since 2014. The new abortion law that Governor Greg Abbott signed into law this week. Within the law is a provision that allows anyone to sue on the grounds that they knew an abortion was performed after a fetal heartbeat was detected. The lawsuits put abortion law compliance in the hands of private citizens and leaves those in the know, including even family members, open to being sued for damages of at least $10,000. So this weekend, some intermittent showers, a few downpours periodically, especially in the afternoon hours, but tomorrow we're thinking around midday, noon, and then into the early afternoon. It's gonna be one of those situations where it looks and feels tropical. You have some sunshine and some gray clouds here or there, shower maybe just a mile away, or it just hits you. It's sporadic in nature, and high temperatures are gonna be right near 80 degrees. We just have to watch out for a little bit of uh, flash flooding, particularly closer to the Gulf Coastline and along the uh, coastal plain. We get into next week, we still have the chance of some scattered showers, mainly afternoon development, Monday and Tuesday, and then we gradually work our way back up into the upper 80s toward the end of next week. Still have more chances. Wow. Telling me there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching the news at six. We'll see you back here on the night beat at 10.